This episode is brought to you by Moo, the place to get delightfully premium business cards, postcards, mini cards, flyers, stickers, greeting cards, and so much more. You're listening to Bare Naked Bravery, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Emily Ann Peterson. This is the place where we expose the threads of heroism that stitch together the stories we admire most. As a musician, singer-songwriter, author, teaching artist, and business owner, I encounter some really fascinating stories. Every episode you'll hear features a revealing conversation with someone who courageously pours themselves out into the world. We'll talk about fears befriended, the terrors battled, and the courage created along our stories of bravery, quiet heroism, and all-out gutsiness. We open the Pandora's box of the dream-crushing constraints we all face during significant moments of bravery. These moments of bare-naked bravery are rarely censored in real life, so if you're listening with little ears nearby, please know that some episodes may contain mature language and subject matter. The questions I ask today aren't scripted because I'm just curious. What is bravery? My hope for us all is that by listening to others search for and find their bravery, we will find our own. For that is what we need most, to know that we are not alone. The best way you can support the show is to share it with a friend or two. Send them an email, text, or tweet. Tag them in one of my Instagram posts. My handle's Emily Ann Pete. Or leave us a review on iTunes. It takes seconds and can be done from your phone right now. Bottom line, we need more bravery in the world. So let's be brave together. Carrie Ockrey has over 25 years experience in the music world. She is the lead singer of the bands Hammerbox, Goodness, The VIPs, The Rockfords with Mike McCready of Pearl Jam, and she's also a solo artist. She's been signed to independent and major labels such as CZ, A&M, Atlantic, Epic, and Immortal Records. After experiencing the highs and the lows of the music industry, Carrie co-founded her own independent record label with a fellow band member of the band Goodness. She released her first solo debut album called Home on this label, and later Carrie then went on to release solo works under her own label, My Way Records, which I think is a really fitting label name. (laughs) She's taught classes at Seattle's Experience Music Project, which is super cool. She uh, also at Rain City Rock Girls, which is so cool, and across other independent venues around the area. So in today's episode, she and I discuss what it's like to break up with the band, how hard it is being the boss, and the importance of like nurturing community when you're starting something new. Oh, and we attempt to bust up the myth of the musical snowflake fantasy. I know Carrie believes we all have the right to be brave and creative and come to the table, and I also know she's really good at starting stuff, so today we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So (laughs) what do you have going now? We'll start in the present and we'll just work our way out from there. All right. Well, what I have going on now is one, I'm turning 50 in a couple months. So that just puts a sort of age frame and midlife on the following conversation. Congratulations, Um, by the way. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Half a century still here. <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, that that age area is, is often a reflective time. You know, we, we have sort of these cyclical times in our lives that are real, I think, transformative moments, you know, in your 20s, 30s, and then midlife. And so right now, for me, I'm really taking a look at post a path of music, but also then kind of corporate work. I'm looking to return to myself and look for work that authentically is something that I love. So my new thing really is about creating a business 
or work that is straight from my heart. And so you mentioned I've taught classes before, which is, is work that every time I do it, I feel really good and it feels purposeful and helpful, not only to hopefully the students, but definitely myself. So I currently am starting work teaching firstly classes at an alternative high school in Tacoma, Washington called SOTA, which is School of Theater and Arts. And I've been invited to teach an advanced music performance class that's really going to be about not just performing music, but about finding out or learning about the road since these kids are in high school, learning about how to function on the road and, and find your authenticity in your center kind of as you go along your path. And some of these kids may find that they love or hate what they do or they need to really dig in and think more about what authentically they want to create art-wise. And so we shall see. The conversation I'm sure is going to be interesting, especially because it's high schoolers who are just at the beginning of their path of, you know, discovering who they are and trying things on for size. And, you know, they're just, they're still little morph pods. And so totally. um, I'm excited. Right? We got, like we, that got to, we got to hear from Zach Varnell earlier in the previous episode. Oh, yeah. And he's starting the public high school idea, IDEA. Yeah. And I personally love soda because not only because I know Zach, but I also have been a guest instructor at the Tacoma School of the Arts. So I love that awesome. school so much. I love it. What did you teach? What did you teach there? Oh, they just invite me in to come do like a, you know, a day performance to come play a couple songs. I think they did. They have one class called the Cover Song Project. And they, oh, get, like, awesome. a, they get like a local music or somebody from the art scene to come in and like pick a cover song and then the kids have to they don't know what the cover song is and they have to split apart and then figure out how to play that cover song together and then they perform it and then the guest instructor votes on who quote-unquote wins the (laughs) wins that day's (laughs) class so oh it's so fun I think the song I picked was a sorry by Justin Bieber nice it was a good one it's actually Mm -hmm. a more complicated piece than you anticipated the beat right. has it going on. So I, I'm more so than people that on. How do you anticipate that looking? I'm obsessing on the class. So my, I've got 26 days, right? Where you teach this class. The yeah. first day is really an intro into here's who I am. Here's what the class is really about. And then some of that's going to be also about setting up an idea of trust you know, rules of engagement kind of thing. Like this is a, this is a place where we're going to go for it. We're going to take risks and there's no room for laughing at people or being diverted by your cell phone. I mean, you don't have to be a hundred percent like, you know, it's realistic as a human, like you might be tired on a day, but to take it seriously. So my theme phrase is I very authentically take you seriously, or I very respectfully take you very seriously. And I expect you to do the same. I imagine that so, is a phrase that you have learned is one of the most valuable when working with bandmates. Well, I think that with artists in general, and I think I've often been disappointed in this arena, is that I personally crave intelligence and true creativity, you know, what, that doesn't have to come with attitude and ego and snarkiness and things like that. Like, I get really excited when I'm around groups who are creating things and discovering. And, and I feel like a lot of times you don't get that people cloister and they isolate and they're insecure and they don't talk to each other. So this is sort of a personal quest, a desire I've always wanted to be in an environment where everyone is chosen to engage and go for it and, and pleasantly, you know, or politely and nicely. And I mean, it doesn't have to be easy all the time and it, it doesn't have to be polite all the time, but but it has to be like forcing you to be my friend. You got to show up and you got to like, you got to choose to participate in this and half fasting it is I'll know, you know, right. like it won't be, it won't be okay. And I say that with someone who's realistic on, you can't force people to always, you know, love everything every day, which I'm perfectly fine with, but I can certainly point out laziness. Someone who doesn't give a crap and they're disruptive. So that to me, I, I don't like. I mean, I've been in, projects or music projects via orchestra or 
you know, bands, like rock bands. You're hilariously more traditional rock bands rather than orchestra. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been in those work environments where apathy is like just this, the worst disease. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and unfortunately people don't realize I'm like, well then this is the most you're going to do for yourself. Like this could be an exciting time or you're, you're choosing now we go, we're going to just slog through crap. And often people will just sit down and slog through crap when it could be much better. Is there a you know, moment that you have like on your top 10 list of those? I was slogging through it. I think number one, I've always, and maybe this is just a band thing. I mean, I, I don't have like 8 million bands I've been in, but my experience has been, there's always one person in the band who's got issues, hopefully not two, you know, and it just drags everything else down and makes everything else harder and stunts possibilities, which I, and I are those for issues me personally. Usually, are those issues usually like inside of themselves or with other people in the group or? Well, I think it can stunt like the creative process. You know, you get with folks who are like, this is the only way to write a good song. I'm like, well, that's just crap right there. You know, like Wilco is not the only band that's good. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> there are other bands that are amazing if you open your mind to that or there's lots of possibilities. I mean, so often as a band, you know, you might have a sound and I'm like, you can stick to the sound, but you can still securely explore like what else is out there that that's personally more exciting to me I, I don't want things to like forever be like you know the person who never finishes their song like, <laughs> like I don't want that but I do love people who are open to possibility so in bands for me it's shown up kind of in someone who's really insecure and they're just like Debbie Downer and they're kind of taking their slowly taking their crap out on everybody by just being negative and and really mostly insecure. And, you know, that turns into eye rolling or, oh, can't be bothered or that nothing's ever good enough. And to me, that's such a creative killer because there's no perfection ever, but ultimately you get nowhere with that, you know, and you, and you suck the life out of everybody. That's probably the biggest thing I've experienced. If someone's got personal issues that are translating into like dogging others or you know sometimes you can just feel those people in the room right they're just like oh can't be bothered to be here uh -huh. yep. and that's got to go but at least if that's happening in class that'll just have to go you know it's because you can't fix everybody you know god bless them <laughs> like I can't you can't you don't want to be mad at folks you can't change them they have to kind of want to change themselves you can certainly be there for them but ultimately you are at the whim of that person discovering that they want to grow or something. So, I mean, it's what hard. has been your experience with encouraging one of your bandmates into a different frame of mind? Because you can't change somebody's mind, but mm -hmm. what can you do? I think you can give your two cents and hopefully, you know, politely as possible. And that's about all you can do. You can present options, you can, or kindness, you can point things out, hopefully in a polite way. So it doesn't make them more defensive but that's about it. I've been in bands where I'm like, hey, I think you're great. Or, you know, what's the problem? Or what's not good enough here? Because my perception is you're great. That's why you're here. I want to have fun. How can I support you? But changing deep seated, like personal visions of how things are is really hard. So you give it your best shot. And then if it doesn't change or get better, you know, like a relationship, if the relationship just doesn't get better, then you have to sort of decide, like, is this adding to your life or detracting? And then sometimes that's a sad decision to say, like, this is not moving anything forward. And it's something I have to leave. So, Which is like, even just having that conversation with yourself is a really brave conversation. It really is. It's really hard. I am amazed at the times I have walked away from things <laughs> I just I I love the 20s because you're just blissfully ignorant you know like it's a, it's a very magical time because you can't you can be very in touch with your intuition you think you're never going to die like you know it's just you're open to discovery it's the decade I think of discovery and I remember walking away from Hammerbox I mean I remember we had a two record deal with A&M Records we had done the first record and it's unheard of to get two guaranteed records, or, you know, especially really now, is. but then too, it really is. 
And I walked away after the first record because I was so miserable. It was just our bass player had left because he was miserable. And then I started to realize that I wanted to learn how to write, you know, like write, write the full songs. I'd been writing the lyrics and melodies for most all of it. And then I was like, well, you know, I didn't know how to play guitar. And so it was, you know, that's a scary thing to sort of put yourself out there. And I felt like the reception I got was, or I perceived the reception is really closed off and not receptive. And so I very, very easily, like cleaner than you can think was like, I'm done, left a practice that was particularly showing to me, walked out. And I remember Harris even said like, you're quitting, aren't you? And I was like, yep. <laughs> and I'm out. <laughs> Wow. And um, I got, I mean, I got calls from our lawyers, our managers going, you're ruining everyone's lives. How can you do this? You'll never get this again. And I just kept thinking, what about me? Like, I'm being slowly emotionally eroded. What about me? Like, no one is saying, hey, are you okay? Like, what's going on? Like, is it that bad? Like, let's see if we can fix. No one gave a crap about like me personally. It was about the business. Right. And so that was very telling to me too. So, but I did, but I literally was not afraid. I, I didn't it never crossed my mind. I wouldn't just start another band and like go for it again. And was just, there was absolutely no fear there. It was amazing to me. <laughs> Which it, it's amazing to me also, because I mean, I know how rare it is to get to that place. I read an article on Huffington Post by an awesome touring artist named Holly the other day and she mm -hmm. equated being a musician to throwing noodles against the wall and waiting for one of them to stick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's yeah. just like that. Well, I think that, you know, when, when I was doing bands, it was a little bit different. It was the tail end of the very traditional or a tradition of getting signed. Like, right. You play a lot of shows, you garner a large audience. Some A&R person notices they show up at a show, see potential, and sign you. Like, that's virtually non-existent, you know what I mean, now. Oh, of course, uh, yeah. Like, from what I gather. So when I was doing music, there still was kind of this pattern that you went through in order to get signed. So there was something in place that was like, here's what you do. And I'll also, Hammerbox was during the grunge, you know, explosion. And so all eyes were on Seattle anyways. It was a very good apex to be a part of like you you had bigger chances of being seen because everybody wanted a piece of it so when I left Hammerbox and then I started to kind of write I played you know I just played the e-string for the longest time I have like three or four songs that are just written on e-string and trying to learn how to play guitar albeit you know slowly and I, and I will say that when I'm you, a very lazy person <laughs> what was the first thing you did when you quit the band I think I went and got a guitar and an amp and like you left have the to practice say, or went directly to the guitar shop. No, I, no, I left the practice and I went over to a friend's house who lived in a warehouse downtown and was like, Oh, I just, you know, and my friend was a painter and, you know, another artist. And so I was like, I got to go tell a friend, share this with somebody. Cause you know, I felt very alone too, but I was like, I need to go tell a friend, like, I've just done this big thing. And, and actually I got the phone calls there at oh. the warehouse where everyone was yelling at me and I would get off and talk to my friend and go, well, just, everyone just yelled at me. <laughs> and he was like, and he's very separate from the music industry. So he was just sort of like, holy hell, what's happening with you? And I was like, Oh, you know, <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's the most refreshing thing to have one of your people be so far removed from your situation that they actually understand it better. Yeah, I think he was, I think, again, we were young and really invincible. So he was sort of like, well, that's wacky. Let's go get a beer. Like, you just didn't think about it. Like, I certainly didn't think about it. I felt relieved. I felt like, you know, when you know you've done the right thing, you feel that sense of lift and release and I just felt lighter and I felt better and so everything else and also because Seattle was so vibrant I was in a very vibrant city I didn't feel like oh I've cut the cord now I'm out here in space with nothing I was like I'm in Seattle like anything's possible I could I'm just gonna start another band you know yeah like, I mean deal. you were in an environment where going to the guitar shop and just picking something up and playing on an e-string was almost normal. 
Yeah. I mean, it was also very, I think, youth culture, right? Like it was just a place packed with everybody doing music. It was, it was a vibrant island unto itself. Yes. I didn't necessarily feel desperate like I needed, you know, the labels. In terms of like, my life was pretty good and happy right there. It was still a very vibrant city that had a lot of attention. And I just thought, well, I have enough things here to create something else. Like, I'm not so desperate. Like, if I was in LA, I would feel so much more desperate because that city doesn't give you anything soul wise. I think you're like right onto something that Seattle, mm-hmm. at least in the, in the nineties, early two thousands had an environment or fostered an environment of go ahead, start something new, be the crazy yeah. one. Whereas LA, and I think this still stands today in LA where it's, oh, they don't want to try anything new unless it's already been done somewhere else. Well, and you can't get anything started. Like in Seattle, without labels alone, I can start a band. I could create my own label. I'd have a cheap practice space. I'd have venues to play in. And that's a good life. You know, like I can get in a van and tour at least the Northwest. Like I didn't need anything. I mean, I can do that without all the labels. I can do a lot and have a community that comes to the shows. We have periodicals that write about it. It's a music city. Like in LA, I think you can't get anybody to come to your show. The clubs are far, you know, totally far apart. It's a real desert in terms of a community. I mean, I'm sure there's other people who've lived there and feel differently or at the, at the time that they were there. Like, but I felt like Seattle was really self-sustaining for a, a level. You know what I mean? There's a certain level. There was a very pleasurable level at the time. I mean, most of most of the people, a lot of the people living in Seattle, I'm, ta- I'm talking just anybody working or whatever, was going to see music as their outlet. You know, music was such a, a huge part of what everyone did in the city, you know, be it concert viewers to musicians, club owners to things like that, and periodicals and all of that. So I just, I felt like, well, I've got a great little utopia I'm living in here. I don't really, I'm not going to feel too deprived if a Records goes away. I can, right. I can still do things. And how do you see your environment or, or what part of starting something new does an environment play? I think it plays, for me, it plays a good chunk because what I'm going to want to do is collaborate. And so, and that means say for these classes, like I'm going to need to find a place to teach these classes or camps or other like-minded people, spots, locations, institutions, people in general who want it. Like I'm going to need a community that's receptive to this or I'd like that. I'm trying to think if it was the opposite. If I was like in a small town, if I was, okay, so if I was in a small town somewhere else in the middle of nowhere, what I would do is probably find that community online. You know what I mean? And I'd be okay just saying like, I'm going to set up a website. Maybe we'll have a forum. I'll have a blog and I'll do podcasts. And maybe that's how I'll attract people, but they'll probably come to me virtually just because my town is small in the middle of nowhere and there's nobody. But creating a community and having, being in an area for me right now, in an area where I'm in a community right now that's very collaborative, very receptive, like-minded, needs it you know, and kind of, it has the magic that I feel like Seattle had, or that I felt in like 89. Seattle's much more populated. It's tech oriented. It's very different than the early 90s. There's plenty of artists there, but it is a very different city than it was in say, 85 to 2000. You and know, now you're it's in just Tacoma, different. like I am. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah. think that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, that, you and I have probably orbited each other so many times. And I think it's really <laughs> great right. that finally we get to like connect in this way. So, yeah. So you're starting these classes. You also have a new band that you started, right? Well, I started this side band five years ago with my brother, Eric Ockrey, and my husband, Martin, and Daniel G. Harmon. Just as a side band, because I missed being in a band, but I just wanted it to be kind of a side thing and, 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 you know, take the elements to me, take the simple, fun elements of being in a band. Like, oh, I want to like my name. Like, I wanted to pretend I was in high school again. Like, 
nobody else gets the name. I like the name. It doesn't matter. You know, nobody, who cares? Nobody's looking. Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. There's um, something so magical about <laughs> doing the art or being part of the group or reading the book or doing the job just because you want to and having no other reason <laughs> attached to it. Yeah. Well, and I needed it because I had lost track of how to feel that way. And I still work on that. I love my 20s because I was blissfully ignorant and I wish I was that way again. But now I feel like I know too much. And so I, d I just want to feel good again and I want to have fun. And those are simple things, but they are essential. And they're really the lifeblood of living when all the other experiences are done or all the business is done and all of that. Like if you're unhappy, then what a joke. And um, I remember when I met my husband, he played bass and I was like, oh yeah, I said, oh, you play bass. And he didn't know anything about me, like nothing, which was good. And I said, oh, do you play music? And he said, oh yeah, I play bass. And I go, oh, what do you do? And he goes, oh, you know, I, me and my brother get together and play for fun. And I was like, I remember my brain going, what? <laughs> like fun what's this thing you're calling fun because I've been doing it as a business for long enough you know when you release a record it's like you make the record you pay for the record you're or you're working yes and it's it's art but then the releasing of the record there's a whole year cycle of shows and bands and press and you know if you can get it you know radio or whatever and you're doing the record release cycle I did not know how to fun you know, I still am working at having fun. <laughs> I hear terrible? you. I hear you. That's I mean, I'm, I am known for amongst my friends. They know me as if I ever on a first date with somebody and the mm -hmm. music, the topic of like, what, what kind of music do you like? I shut that conversation down so quick because, <laughs> <laughs> because I, because I know I'm judgmental about it. Like I know it. So yeah. I don't, I want to give that person a chance. So I just shut that conversation down. Like, what do you do for work? <laughs> right. Because I don't want to go, oh, you like Blink-182 still. Okay. Uh -huh. you know, like, oh, oh. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't. So yeah. <laughs> thanks so much. Have a great day. You know? Like, yeah. I want yeah, to. Yeah, I have a big opinion on that and I'm going to judge you by it. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. And I think that comes from a place of knowing that I, like you, want music to be fun. And I would want to build up that lack of judgmentalness in myself, towards myself, yeah. more. Yeah. Well, and you have a life experience that most people don't have. That's another thing that I finally like embraced was you have a unique experience. And that's great, but I do feel like that can set you aside and alone, right? Like, at least for me, that was one thing hard that was like, I didn't have that many people that I could go talk to. Like, I, I regret or wish that I'd had more peers that were my best friends. Like I didn't have girlfriends. I didn't have peers didn't talk to each other. Like, how are you doing? How are you okay? You know, like, at least the people I know, or maybe I was very lonerish. And I think that doing music on any professional level is a very unique experience. And sometimes, I'm probably going to say it wrong, like powerfully isolating. Because it also can be people put you on a pedestal or people look at you different and all of a sudden you're isolated, right? Like the minute someone says, oh, Carrie does music professionally. She's a Googler. You can, all of a sudden, I am now. Now you're at an a, anomaly. You're an anomaly and it's, you're alone and everyone's looking at you like you're a special fairy. And you're like, I'm not. And it's not that unique. You're like, oh, God, you all have a very special magical feeling about artists and have probably ideas of what you think my life is like, or you're just isolating me because now I'm not with you. I'm separate from you. Right. Because I'm this thing. Right. Well, and that and happens. Terrible. It doesn't matter like musicians, artists, creative or not, like that could happen in science, you know, like, oh, you're a oh, geologist. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Know? Or yeah. like, it doesn't matter what field or what relationship that we're talking about like that putting someone separate from the group is you yeah. you are in control of that not that person right but i think people look at artists like say if you were an actor or artist they look at that as a magical thing you know what i mean like oh you were in a band and for them that conjures up all sorts of fantasies 
And that's what you're working against is the, or not even working against, but that's what you're working with. Is there a fantasy? And you don't want to have to go like, oh, I don't want to dispel your fantasy because that reminds me of how, for me, that how sad I am to not be a young, happy, naive kid, just loving music. I know too much now. And that just, I think, reiterates a sadness in me when I, someone's like, oh, you're in a band. What's that? You know, like that's a mate, you know. I can't tell if me just saying that alone is just sad. I need to rethink it and look at it differently. But that is an experience. And I have felt that. I mean, I felt it too, because especially if you are still in a band and you are still doing it to some degree, your professional career cannot afford for you to remove yourself from that pedestal. Well, yeah. You know, like well, you, and it's, your career, you're, the fact that you're paying rent is depending upon, in some respects, the fact that other people have fantasies about what it's like to be a musician. So if you remove all of that yeah. altogether, then the pull to like be interested in what you're doing is gone and that, and, and so is your ability to pay rent. Well, you know, this might seem like a really egotistical way to look at it, but I'm like, it's very hard to be queen. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I'm it's right very hard me. to be royalty. Yeah. It's very hard to like, say if this was just me, you know, medieval times and like, well, you were born into royalty and you need to learn how to handle that and what it's going to mean to be queen. You know what I mean? You will be removed from everyone in order to preserve, like you're saying, your position and what you look like and what that means to the people. And that needs to be kept in place in order to preserve a fantasy or their chance to just enjoy loving an artist. People love to, I mean, it's not a bad thing, like no. to say, uh, to have reverence for an artist, you know, that it, it is a magical thing. But for those who are the artists, like you're still a human being. <laughs> still right. So it can make your shitty day seem farcical for you on the shitty day. You're like, what a joke. Like, yeah, I sure wish I felt like David Bowie, you know, like that I'm, I'm all that in a bag of chips, but I feel fat and boring and depressed and all the human ugly feelings, right? Not, oh, not yeah. something special. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I'm so with you. The days that I like leave the house after doing like a full day of whatever it is, music-y stuff or market-y stuff or whatever, I'll like leave the house at five or six or whatever. And it will be the first time I yeah. put on pants and the first time I put on my glasses and I get to yeah. the party or the dinner or whatever. And someone's like, Oh, did you just have a fantastic day of doing blah, 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 blah. You know, they fill in the blanks. <laughs> and I kind of want to just say, actually, I'm still wearing my pajamas right now. You just don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But that's why, that's why I think true, true friends and a true circle is so invaluable. Yes. You know, because I think you need a respite place. You need a place where you can go, who are we kidding, buddy? You know what I've been through. Let me yeah. go. I need to go someplace I could be myself and a knowledgeable place. It's so, God, that's worth everything. Oh, it definitely um, is. I'm so grateful that I have that right now. That's awesome. I strive to maintain it, you know, and, and keep that part of my life healthy and fruitful just because I know how much I need it as a person. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, you need the nourishment as well to produce more of your art. It's a vulnerable thing to do to create art. It's a brave thing to do to make art, I think. It is. It is. Before we get back to the conversation, I want to tell you a little bit more about today's sponsor, Moo Cards. They are the only company I've ever ordered business cards or custom printed paper goods from. In fact, if you've ever attended a concert of mine, then you've probably seen their Lux business cards on my merchandise table after the show. Every single order I've made from Moo has been so easy and quite honestly, really fun. But I'm a design nerd like that. So even if you're not a design nerd, you can select from some of their expertly designed templates so you know you won't look like an idiot while handing somebody your flyer. Oh, and their new line of Lux paper goods gets an awesome reaction from my fans every single time. So if you've ever wanted someone to say, I get to keep this when you hand them your business card, then you should go to barenakedbravery.com forward slash moo, M-O-O. So you start 
started this new band with your brother. What's the name of the band again? Mm-hmm. It's it's, Esther. it's called Esther Kang. That's what I thought, Esther Kang. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And you got one. I was I was snooping on you before you called. Mm-hmm. You guys have <laughs> one song or one track on SoundCloud from your rehearsal, and I was loving it. <laughs> Oh, Oh, that's good because that recording is so awful. But I was like, hey, I don't care. It's what we've got. Like, I love um, it. I think that's (laughs) those kinds of recordings are what people really want to hear, anyways. Like, they want to hear, right? They want to hear what's up. That's part of like the fantasy. They want to like yeah. behind the curtain and go like, what happened? Yes, you know. So, okay, how do you do that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So with your brother, like what kind of frame of mind were you in before you started this new project? Well, I actually, I'd had a baby actually. So I had my son, Orion, and I think he was two. And I think I was just missing music. Like I played music up until I was eight months pregnant. And that was my third solo record and then stopped just because I needed to. Um, and then the first couple years of having Orion, I mean, I was just more consumed by motherhood. And frankly, when I started the band, I struggled with that. I equally, my love for him is so profound and I have personally feel a pull to be with him. So it kind of made sometimes, and again, I still have to work at this. It's like going to do music kind of seemed trivial. Like, oh, I'm leaving my son to go do what? Like, why are we doing this? Like, it, it better matter because I'm away from my son, you know? <laughs> and matter in the way that I probably needed to learn a little more about. Like, you're doing this for you because it feels good and you need to feel good. Or you need this part of yourself. And so I, I started it for those reasons. But I, in between then, had had a kid. So wasn't doing any of that. And I kind of wanted, I just wanted it to be easy too. I was just like, I just want, you know, we're all seasoned enough, except for Marty and poor Marty's like, he's gotten to play like in my band solo stuff. He's an Esther Kang, you know, but the rest of us, I think have been playing for, I mean, Eric's been playing since he was 13, you know, it's like, we've been playing for like 30 years. It's crazy, you know? So Marty's good to have in the band just because for him, this is newer and for me, I just want to pull together people who are seasoned and see what we come up with. And just, you know, the simple things like I want to get together. Let's make a, I want it to be rock. Let's see what we come up with. Right. And just enjoy that. So, I mean, we're currently doing a little GoFundMe and, you know, just, I said, we have like five songs. We have more than that. But I was like, let's just do an EP. Cause I just really, what I really want is I just want to record, you know what I mean? Like I miss being in the studio. I'm like, let's make a big fat, like, you know, loud rock EP. That's all I want. <laughs> I don't even care if anybody buys it. <laughs> I think that is so fantastic. It is flipping fantastic. <laughs> I do. Well, it's so funny. There's the four of us have gotten together and I secretly really want a second guitar player. So I will be, I will be letting folks know. And we have a guy in Tacoma that we really want to join us. I mean, there's tons of musicians, you know, like in Tacoma. Oh, yeah. oh my God. So our friend, Ashley Rivera, who plays at a bunch of bands here and he's such a nice guy and he does great. T- uh, he does tattoos and all sorts. Of, he's awesome. He's just sweet. And I was like, Oh yeah, I want Ashley in the band. Let's do that. Like, I feel like a kid. I'm like, Oh yeah, let's get Ashley in the band. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Let me ask you a question. This is kind of a strange question. If building a band or putting a team of creatives together, this is band, mm-hmm. design, engineering, whatever. If putting a team of people together, were a recipe, what Mm -hmm. kind of recipe would it be? Like a salad or a bread or a casserole or a stew, a stew. It would definitely be a stew. Yeah. I mean, I, I I know why you are saying that. (laughs) Well, because it's one, it's, um, you're all in the same boat or bowl, you know, it's sort of a bowl. It, it seems more like hold you, you know, like a chalice or a bowl holds you all together and you've got your different elements in there. But as they melange, melange, I'm the French word, as they mingle together, they all combine together to make a delicious stew or soup, right? It's all the elements together, you know, simmering, taking time, And once they all get to know each other and play a lot together and get, you know, finally like click in terms of, I know what you need. Here's my sound. Our sounds all go together. It's like soup. You know, it's a really good stew. It's like everything is just mixed together 
to make, and also I like warm things too. So it's warm and yummy and it nourishes you, you know? I so agree. So the, yeah. I so agree. I, I love, like when you get a group of people together, it is so hard to separate yourself from them in terms of the group dynamic. Like that. Oh yeah, you shouldn't though. And yeah. I don't think you should. Yeah. Because you are all little creative entities coming together to make a tapestry or make something you have to be together. You know, you can't, I think that's the difference between like say a Britney Spears thing where there's her and then hired guns and writers and producers, which makes pop music and pop music is a one thing, but I don't think it's as rich and that kind of rich and deep as a group of artists. I'd say more like a quartet, you know, or an orchestra has that kind of thing too. Although I don't, maybe they don't think about it the same way they follow along or, but there's passion there. There's something about really coalescing. You know, I just watched a documentary on Bob Weir and I'm not a Grateful Dead fan, but I really liked their talk about why they were together. I thought that was really, it really was about what they would create together with no intention of about selling a ton of records at the time. You know what I mean? It was a real groovy, like, let's create some music, man. Like, <laughs> Let's get together and see what we do and do it well. And, we have a, and we'll bring our influences in and we'll talk about them and play them and play off each other. And that will be the cool thing that we make. That is the thing. Yeah, like I think, our artistry. I think if, if groups or bands can really approach working together as a collective rather than this like ego wrapped you know, goat cheese filled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. The ego thing is so pointless. Oh, it's like yeah. an empty calorie, right? It's such an empty calorie. <laughs> it's so pointless. It goes nowhere and does not create anything. Yes. Really, other than a mess. <laughs> it, it really does. And there's not a lot of rescue remedies for a group dynamic that has become imbalanced from ego. No, again, because it comes down to the individual. Like, again, if, you're, if your friend goes off the rails and say they become an alcoholic, that's a personal journey and issue, right? Like you can't, nobody can group think that better exactly. back together again, you know, you can, even individually, right? So you are still made up of individuals who all have their own paths and their own backgrounds and their own bullshit. So for a while, maybe that all works together for a while. And then something, as time goes on, events, something triggers them changing their mind about how they feel about themselves or where they want to be or their rights to things or, you know, doesn't, it's not, I feel like there's these moments in time where everything is great. And then, you know, change, which is constant happens and it morphs. I can understand why it's rare that there are bands out there who've been together for 20 years. And those bands, I think, work at it. Yeah. Like, for a relationship, you know? I think a really cool job, I'm sure people exist out there like this, but a really cool job would be a therapist to the bands. Oh, my God. Like uh, I'm sure Metallica. they exist. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> they exist out there. You know, like, did, you, did you ever see the Metallica documentary? I haven't yet, no. Oh my God, go see it. Cause it's okay. all about the therapist they got. I'm writing, it down. <laughs> I'm writing it down right now. We're going to put it in the show notes yeah. too. Cause oh my God, do it. I want to do Cause it's kind of icky and weird, you know, like, I mean, you've got guys who have some serious, like, well, you've got substance abuse and you've got also people with childhood hurts and parents who are crappy to them. And you can see all the human things come out and explain like their controlling ways or their destructive ways and all this, but you're also mega stars. So wading through ego and power and entitlement to get to your humanness. Wow. is hard, you know, and who's the therapist who's that grounded? It's gotta be like Pema Chodron or somebody like, you know, a Buddhist, <laughs> like who's, who's truly honest enough, who doesn't care about you, who's going to really serve you correctly to help you. Otherwise, right the music industry you get some creepo and they was like I'll be your therapist and I'm like oh. <laughs> or you're gonna get a page I don't know what you're doing here <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's really true like you have to really roll your sleeves up in order to oh, get to your humanness yes e even individually don't you think like oh, even yeah. as you manage your own self oh my god Ugh. yikes I know 
I don't want to say it's hard because I think words have power, but I'm like, it's a journey. <laughs> like passively, <laughs> it's a journey. <laughs> oh God, that's trying to be positive. So, okay. So I want to ask you a question because I've been in groups, bands, you know, musical groups, and mm-hmm. then the last three years have started doing more solo stuff. And mm-hmm. I had be- heard from folks before going solo, playing solo shows is very different than playing in bands. And in, I like knew that in my head. And then yeah. in the last three, four or five years, I've experienced that firsthand. Yeah. And I haven't quite wrapped my head around what it is that is so different about being in a solo, like doing something solo, doing a solo project versus doing a group project. How does it feel for you? What are your feelings around it? Oh, I mean, you it's feel... good. like it's good. It's just, I haven't quite wrapped my head around like, why does it feel so different? And I think I've had, you know, I've heard from some fellow musician friends who've gone solo or have both solo and group projects. And they, they say that like going solo is scarier than being in a band, but then other people say that being well, yeah. is scarier than being solo. I think, I mean, Viva the Dictatorship, God love being solo. I mean, you own everything, right? Like you, you get to complete a thought, like it's you, you get to complete a full thought and see what else you're capable of or what do you, only you want to express. Like, that's pretty awesome. Like, I'm not saying it's the only way, cause I certainly like being in bands too. But like when I went solo, I was like, I was ready. I was like, shut up everybody. I just want to know what I'm doing. <laughs> So I was really naturally ready to do that. I'm not saying it was easy because you're also then responsible for everything. You're not sharing the financial load, the organizational load with the whole, you know, four or five other people, right? Like, so it's all you all day, including the business, unless you get someone to help you. And on the one hand, I enjoyed that too, but I also in the end realized I can't do all of it and burned myself out pretty hardcore. Like I... I like doing business. Like I, t- I think I'm fairly good at it and then kind of feel like it's hard to find someone who's going to work as hard as you or be as good at it. You know what I mean? Like think of all the things that you could do and help build. It's like trying yeah, I mean, to find a best friend, I, I right? See, like, <laughs> I can totally see there being a, a point in my future where I think, why have we not figured out cloning? <laughs> right. Yes. Why can't I just clone well, because, myself to do this all like at a desk and then? <laughs> um, yes. Well, and maybe you can like help me answer too, because at the time, I mean, I, after a while, I mean, I think I had my, I had an intern, but that was it. You know, part of me was, I just knew how to get it done, but to the detriment of myself and doing music, I think it made me very burnt out and depressed, but I also didn't take the time and maybe you should do this and tell me how it goes, is wish for it. I never sat down and said, universe or whatever. I'm like, send me a manager. And the manager looks like this. I want it to be for me. Like, I want a super smart, kind female. We're going to be like partners in a production company. Like we are in it together, but they're funny. They're smart, trustable, honest. And they'll go, they've got the energy to go get it. Like I never, I'm a believer in writing things down and kind of wishing for it. And I never did that. I mean, never say never, but I think you got to kind of visualize it and say, what do you need? Right. What do you need? Well, I like, I need a partner. I had definitely have done that for individual seasons and have thought like, okay, I know that like, these are the 10 things that I know I have to do. And I know I'm going to be really good at these five and these other five I'm, is going to suck balls real hard. <laughs> yeah. Good for and, you. <laughs> and then I, I kind of am aware of where my weaknesses are and then ch- usually choose to ask someone to help with those areas or oh, good, whatever. But I really love the vision. It, you're kind of like vision boarding a, a person. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because I got part of me was I kept falling into this pattern of, and again, I think this is something I'd love to teach that I'm learning still is that when you notice a pattern happening, like to really consciously sit down and look at it and be like, what's going on here? What do you really want? Let's get to it. 
because I kept having over and over again, people saying, Oh my God, I love what you do. I love what you do. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't help you. Like over and over. It was so depressing. I would be in tears. Like I went to, you know, reaching out to people for, to manage or someone would say like, I heard you on the radio. It was amazing. And they managed people. And so we went and had a meeting. She's like, Oh, but I'm too busy. And I literally was almost in tears. Just like, what is happening? Like, okay. But I'm sure some of it was me, you know, like nobody explains, I think the up and downs of like artists path. I mean, there's lots of good books though. I mean, I certainly, I should say it was not explained to me in my family anywhere. <laughs> Let um, me ask you this. How many yeah. times did you make the decision to quit? Oh, God. I still make the decision to quit. <laughs> I, uh, I only ask why? that question because I make that decision to quit almost daily. Do you do this? Do you go, who gives a shit? Why write another song? I'm tired. I want to sit in the backyard and... yes. You know, like, who gives a shit? Like, why, why am I doing this? And that's the thing. It's like, so when I think when that happens, when you need that circle of friends and very lucky, you know, to nourish you. I'm sorry, because I think artists need nourishing. They need a pat on the back and a little bit of like, no, please keep making music because your record got me through a divorce, you know, like, or here's why it's valuable and good. And then on the, on the second hand, you need to know when you need to be nourished. Like you need to go sit in a forest for three months and absolutely do nothing in three months. Don't bring your phone. You know what I mean? Like just to know what you need as an artist. Cause I certainly didn't. And I feel like I ping pong, like in a pinball machine, just like rah, crashing, burning, rah, crashing, burn. You know, like, <laughs> it's so much harder to pick yourself up by yourself to self motivate. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, like I'm in the thick of that still. Oh, like, yeah. I don't I, I, I'm going to call you more often. <laughs> okay. Come on, girl. We'll go have coffee. Oh, I, I love it. I don't anticipate ever having that struggle of wanting to quit. I don't anticipate <laughs> that ever going away. Sure. Yeah, I get it. And some of it, I know that I need that struggle to some degree. Like I know how much friction matters to vibration. Yes. Not yeah. Great unless there is friction happening somewhere. You know, you should go get go get this book because you're making me think of this. I think like a lot of artistic things and entrepreneurial work, be it businesses, is resistance is a huge yes. factor entity, right? So there's the book, The War of Art. I love that book. Right? And so I got the one, I got his other book. It's called Do the Work. And again, it's just like, I feel like it's a supportive book of like, mm, here's secret resistance coming back telling you to sit down and watch Netflix for three days instead of like writing a song, you know, or exercise. I think that that is there a lot. It's just figuring out the ways to mentally lighten the load, take the pressure off, always have bottom lines. Like I have bottom lines where I'm like, Hey, 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 this is not curing cancer. Right. If you don't want to put out a record, you don't have to, you know what I mean? Like, but at least I know. And again, I'm still, I'm struggling with this today is to do nothing is not, no, right? Like to do nothing. Like if you need to get up and just play your guitar 20 minutes every day, you do need to do that. But right. if then you're done, then you go cook or you go do what you need to do. But there's that balance between, I feel like resistance, but also taking the load off of how important it is or should, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda, or I'm supposed to do this. I ought to do this. All of that weight, I feel like it's pointless. It's like, no, no, if you, if you never did this again, you were just happy. That's a good life. That's a great life. What's wrong with that? And I think you know that's, I mean? that's all we can ask for is to like relieve that pressure off the pressure cooker yeah. and to just stew. <laughs> to yeah. Bring or, you it know, full circle. <laughs> yeah. Or channel it into a whole nother art form. You know what I mean? Like a podcast or poetry or, you know, maybe another song, but the, some that I like a second Joni Mitchell said this too. She thought it was very important to have a second art form that you did. Yeah. Like to paint, right? She paints. She said it was extremely important for a musician, I think, to have another art form, another release. When the pressure cooker maybe of music gets to be too much, you still need a release, but this one's cooked out yep. <laughs> for a while, you know? Yep. So I, totally um, agree. I think that that's, yeah. 
Well, I am just, I, I know that our time is, is running up and I don't want to take up your whole day, but is I it? do. Yeah. So funny. Isn't that amazing? Good conversation. It oh, is. I loved it. So anyone who's listening can go just Google Carrie Ockrey, A-K-R-E, and her, she'll come up and you can watch all her stuff from the 90s on YouTube like I did earlier today. <laughs> you can follow her on Facebook, Twitter. She's on Instagram and SoundCloud. And Carrie, I want to have you back because we didn't talk. I would love it. Enough. You name it. I would totally love it because it's good for me. Maybe we need to just have a musician's like help crisis line. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'd love it. <laughs> I'd love yeah, it. And I definitely want to have coffee. You have to do that. Okay. You're on. Let's make it happen. Right. Okay. Let's make it happen. All right. So that's our show this week. Thank you for listening. Again, we've put all the links in the show notes so you can watch those documentaries talked about and read the article from the Huffington Post that I mentioned. I'll also put in all of Carrie and Mai's contact information for social media and all that. So please be sure to visit us online. Just go to barenakedbravery.com. And if you've enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it for you, then please give us a review. Rate the show on your iTunes desktop app or on your podcast app on your phone. And it, you guys, it just helps so much to get us up in the rankings so that more people can hear the show and hear everyone's stories. And I know that their bravery deserves to be spread as far and as wide as possible. And you are a part of that. So thank you ahead of time. Speaking of things you're a part of, Bare Naked Bravery has an adult coloring book. It's so great. It features designs from over 10 talented visual artists, all kinds from all over the world. And this means you can make the art from a fellow Bare Naked Bravery listener, and you can make it come to life while you listen to the show, which is so neat. We'd all love for you to post your finished pages on Instagram so that we can all admire the many shades of your bravery. Just download the whole thing for free, or you can purchase the paperback version by visiting barenakedbravery.com forward slash color. And not only that, but everyone involved in making this coloring book wants you to vote for your favorite four brave charities to receive the proceeds from the coloring book which is so neat. Again, just visit barenakedbravery.com forward slash color for more information. If you love the music from today's episode, that's because it's brought to you by my friends at Music Box Licensing, a premier creative music agency dedicated to finding and crafting unique soundtracks. To find out more about all the artists and the musicians and the other sponsors of the show and to find out how to become a sponsor of the show, just visit barenakedbravery.com forward slash sponsors. I'm looking forward to being with you next week. We have some really great things in store for you. Until then, I have one message for you. It's this. Be yourself. Be vulnerable. Be brave. Because the world needs more of your bare naked bravery. <laughs>